distribution seminar and I'm um, happy that we are just stable in numbers because there is again a very nice and very interesting talk uh, on the podium here and I'm really happy to welcome Scott Rabbit Robinson. Um, he's, he's currently uh, at Montana State University and it's just kind of in a form of transitioning in a PhD program and I also got the privilege to kind of help him in the mentoring uh, process with uh, another fantastic faculty back in, uh, in Missoula. So Scott has a great history of the, all the research that he did compared to his young age, uh, and I will read a short intro. He sent me a longer one, but he said, well, <laughs> you should probably do the long part. So he will tell about himself anyway. So Scott Robinson earned his BS in forestry in Michigan uh, at Michigan Tech. He stayed at the same school and earned his master's degree in forest ecology and management. His thesis work involved the validation of US forest service forest soil disturbance monitoring protocol and development of the viable sampling alternatives following silvicultural activities on the cluster national forest. Uh, Scott now is excited to be pursuing his dissertation at Montana State University on a project that explores the efficacy of various remediation strategies on metal and arsenic contaminated soils in mining impacted areas of Montana. And again, that was a much shorter, shorter <laughs> version that I wanted to read to you, but I think uh, it will be much more uh, worth to listen to Scott's words and welcome to Scott. I'm very Thanks, Robert, and uh, thanks everyone for coming out here. Uh, the only thing that was missing was just that I was a management forester for the state of Montana and a forest soil scientist for the Lolo National Forest prior to coming to work at Montana State. So that was about it. Uh, so a couple of dis disclaimers. Um, my talk has a little background about butte mining. You know, that's old hat for a lot of you, but I don't really know a better way to introduce this. So. Uh, just bear with it if you can. And then I take kind of a, a simple ecologist approach to some of this geochemistry. So with that in mind, I'll get started. Um, so gold mining began in the Upper Clark Fork River Basin in the mid-1860s uh, near Butte, where we or you live. Um, silver followed in 1880s. However, it would be copper that crowned Butte, the richest hill on Earth. Uh, by 1896, smelting operations were working in Butte and Anaconda, but in Anaconda they were processing approximately 4,500 metric tons of ore per day. Uh, by the 1910s, nearly all the smelting operations had moved from Butte to Anaconda, and the Washoe smelter was uh, smelting nearly, well, nearly 11,500 metric tons of ore per day. And so when this was all said and done, in 1981, over 1 billion tons of ore and waste rock was produced from the Butte District, that's mind-boggling to me. Um, and so, of course, with all that mining, we can expect there to be some sort of mining contamination. In fact, there is. Uh, this is primarily driven by the characteristics of the ore. Uh, Butte, some of the Butte ores range from 4% to 18% arsenic by weight. Uh, a couple examples would be an argite and arsenopyrite. Uh, and in general, the smelting process produce flue dust, small grain tailings, and slag containing 100 to 1,000 times the natural levels of arsenic, copper, lead, sulfur, and zinc. Uh, in 1907, the estimated contaminant release from the smelter um, to the environment was about 27 metric tons per day of arsenic, copper, lead, sulfur, and zinc. By 1978, technology allowed that total contaminant load to become about 528 metric tons for the year, so that's a big Massive improvement. Um, so the Anaconda Smelter Superfund site was placed on the national priorities list in 1983, and it totals approximately 300 square miles. Um, the nearly 100 years of smelting produced uh, 20,000 acres contaminated by airborne emissions, 230 million cubic yards of tailings, uh, 30 million cubic yards furnace slag, and 500,000 cubic yards of fluta. So. A lot, of, a lot of action there. Um, and large scale in situ, in situ remediation of the site began in 2006. So in 2015, the EPA's last update, they say that 11,551 acres of open space have been remediated. So that means there's about 
as of 2015, 8,275 acres of open space, which I think is the 20,000 acres impacted by the airborne emissions. Um, left to be remediated. However, in 2014, the NRCS produced this map, which is a qualitative map um, that is just looking at soil metalloid levels based on veg cover. And so the yellow is uh, moderate impact, uh, the red is severely impacted, and um, the reason I bring this up is uh, because while it focuses primarily on Superfund, um, there is areas outside of Superfund, and this is also showing that areas that might not be subject to remediation based on uh, you know, the cutoff for levels, um, how they decide what to remediate and how. Um, I just wanted to show this as a, as a way to think about that there's a lot of opportunity essentially to further study and develop some other remediation type techniques. Um, but so far, principal in situ remediation techniques to date have been the removal of contaminants um, of the top two centimeters uh, the top two inches of soil, that's really where the contaminant load from the airborne emissions is. If it's super severe, they'll remove it, replace it. Um, if not, if it's a little less severe, then they'll add the addition of lime, lime and OM, or lime and fertilizer, or maybe the combination of all three. And if the uh, pollution, the contaminant load isn't too bad, they'll just till it. So a dilution solution to potentially you know, move those contaminants through the profile so you dilute it out. Um, so maybe we should talk about the effects of these amendments. Um, so lime is a common one, and just in general, lime. Uh, yeah, what's the uh, OM acronym for? Oh, soil organic matter. In this case, the OM is going to stand for uh, organic matter, but that organic matter is specifically type of compost, which I'll talk about in this next slide. Sorry, thank you. Um, so lime, in general, uh, raises soil pH. Um, it also has the high capacity to bind metals, potentially lowering their phytoavailability. However, lime has also been shown to decrease the mobility of other micronutrients, uh, potentially causing plant stress. Um, so not great. But spent lime, what they're using mostly in anaconda analysis, is sugar beet lime, waste product. Uh, it does seem to offer some sort of nitrogen and phosphorus. And here is... Um, Casey Harvey on a project, I think in Colorado, uh, adding lime and, and then it's tilled in using farming techniques. <clears throat> so the next one, the effects of amen uh, amendments on comp for compost, so that's the OM. If I refer to OM, it's gonna be a compost treatment, so sorry about that. Um, and specifically, we look at, I looked at eco-compost in my study, the study, greenhouse study prior to mine looked at eco-compost, but there's a whole different, a whole array of composts that are derived from plants or biosolids that have been used as some sort of organic amendment in soil remediation. But for, for this talk and for me, I'll just pretty much focus on the eco-compost. Um, so eco-compost provides some plant limiting nutrients. It also provides a substrate for microbes. It also raises the soil pH. It has a liming, <coughs> equivalent liming content of 19 pounds per ton. And eco-compost also has a very high iron content. 64 to 9600, I've seen both those numbers in two different sheets, two different uh, chemical sheets. Um, and another benefit of compost is it increases water holding capacity, which in semi-arid environments could be very beneficial. And I'm gonna introduce biochar. Biochar is not really used in anaconda. They've had some success with it in Colorado <laughs> treating metal contaminated soils. I used it in my study. And I'll get into that a little more. Um, really, it had to do with pH. And um, so I wanted to uh, look at a different organic amendment uh, as opposed to lime. And so biochar, uh, woody, and I used woody-derived biochar. Um, so that raises soil pH. It also has a liming equivalent. However, it does some things maybe that lime doesn't do. And that's improve cation exchange capacity, which allows for nutrient retention and better cycling and it also increases metal absorption capacity of the soil. Um, and again, it increases water holding capacity, which in these semi-arid semi -arid environments can be very beneficial, and it does have some nutrients. And this is a picture of what happens, an illustration of what happens when 
Woody residue is heated um, from 400C to 2500C, and what you see is it starts to form this kind of layered three-dimensional um, honeycomb-shaped object here, kind of more like a clay film, and that's really where you're going to get that improved cation exchange capacity. Um, so again, this is the you know, ecologist's take on metal geochemistry, but we've been talking about what these amendments are doing, so we should talk about why that, what, and why that is, why they're having that impact. Um, so this Chan et al. paper suggests that pH and reducing soil conditions uh, promote metal solubility. And in that paper, they also say that the effect of pH is more important than redox in soils. And so this graph here is just pH 5. Sorry, I shake a lot when I'm nervous. Uh, 5 and 8. You have metal solubility on the Y here, which is parts per million milligrams of one of these lead, cadmium, zinc, it's hard to see this, um, per kilogram of soil. Um, and then on the, on the Y there, it's pretty much going from the left. You have oxidizing conditions, zero. You have, it's starting to move towards reducing conditions. And on the far right, you have anaerobic or reducing conditions. And what you see is there's a general trend at low pH for those three metals to become more soluble. Um, this scale here below, that's five times less than this. So what we do see, though, at pH of 8, as we're moving across that redox, is uh, there's still some increase. But in general, there's a huge decrease in metal solubility between that, uh, between pH 5 and pH 8. Um, an interesting story here, though, is that of those metals, lead seems to be becoming more soluble um, at a higher pH than the other ones. Um, so why is this important? It's important because in areas where the pH is near neutral, uh, the remedial action is more likely to be a dilution solution, and that's mixing either the 6 or top 12 inches of topsoil. So this means that metals and arsenic could still potentially be plant available in impact performance. Um, and this is especially true for arsenic because it has the opposite mobility as metals. So let's talk about arsenic then. Um, inorganic arsenic exists primarily in two states. Arsenite, AS3, is the reduced form. Arsenate, AS5, is the oxidized form. Biological processes are largely influencing which form arsenic is in. And they've shown that biotic oxidation rates of AS3 to AS5, so arsenite to arsenate, have been seven orders of magnitude higher than abiotic uh, rates. And then also, we know that physicochemical conditions like the amount of soil organic matter, the type and amount of soil organic matter, pH, iron, and phosphate levels tend to control uh, the behavior of arsenic. And so why the focus on arsenic species is that arsenate, AS3, the reduced form, is 10 times more toxic to plants and potentially 10 times more mobile than arsenate, the oxidized form. And ultimately, the big take home is that just like metals, arsenic cannot be destroyed. Only its form can be changed to try and limit um, its toxicity. So uh, we know that the biotic process is really driving what form that is in. Specifically, that biotic process is microbes. They're really controlling that. Um, and uh, arsenic exists just under phosphorus on the periodic table here. It is of similar size and shape. It, therefore, it's an analog. Uh, so oftentimes, when a microbe is in, uh, it runs into this sort of arsenate. So arsenate's analog to phosphate. So um, oftentimes, the, micro, the microbial uh, community will be running into arsenic in either of the forms, arsenate or arsenite. Um, more commonly, uh, it happens that arsenate will be taken into that cell because it gets confused with phosphate. Essentially, it just kind of sneaks through this phosphate transporter. Well, we all know that arsenic is highly toxic, so microbes, just like everything else, need to try and get rid of it. And the most common way to get rid of it that most microbes show is this taking in arsenate, reducing it to arsenite, and then extruding it out of the cell. Um, however, there is some microbes that do the opposite. So arsenite can still, the, the reduced form, AS3, can still come into the cell 
comes in through a different way, the aquaglycerol porins, but then that uh, arsenate is subsequently oxidized and released as arsenate. But really, what we, this is probably the easiest way to think about it, is AS oxidizing bacteria take the, the, the more toxic form, oxidize it to AS5, the least toxic or the less toxic form, and AS reducing bacteria uh, take in arsenate and kick out arsenite. And then there is an example of metabolism that's chemolithotrophs, and they can use inorganic arsenic as an actual energy source. That's not very common. Um, so if we know the process, and we know that microbes are really performing this process, um, the next step into learning or knowing where to go get these microbes to use them potentially to control arsenic toxicity might be here. <laughs> Yellowstone's probably a good place to start um, naturally high levels of arsenic. Um, however, it's, you know, that's a lot of water, maybe not less soil. So the next best thing maybe is to go to what drains Yellowstone. And that's the Madison River. And in fact, in 2004, Rich Maker at MSU and Tim McDermott went to the Madison River floodplain and um, were, went to go characterize some of these potential arsenic oxidizing or arsenic reducing bacteria uh, from these naturally elevated levels of arsenic in the soil. And what they found was that, or what they were able to characterize is they found three arsenite oxidizing bacteria, right? That's the one that we want. We want it to go three to five. Five's the less toxic form. Um, and five bacteria were isolated that cannot oxidize AS3 or they reduce it. So it comes in as five and then it's kicked out as three, the more toxic form. Um, and here is just kind of one of, so this is a kind of an interesting thing here. One of the arsenic oxidizers is this egg tumefaciens, Agrobacterium tumefaciens 5A. And that'll come back up again. Um, but what they also found when they were culturing this out is they found this mutant of it this Agrobacterium tumefaciens 5B. And what that mutant couldn't do, it couldn't oxidize arsenite to arsenate. So it actually reduced it. It took, it took arsenate to arsenite in. And that's exactly what this graph is just showing. You have this uh, amount of arsenite here. You have time on the bottom. And you have this density measurement on the other Y, and you just see that arsenite in the presence of the arsenite oxidizers, this 5A arsenite is being, uh, you know, removed as the density of these colonies grow. And in the case of this mutant, it cannot do that. It reduces, so you have this arsenate here, AS5, that's being removed as the um, colony grows. And I guess the best thing about this uh, for potential is bioremediation is that uh, the arsenite oxidizing uh, bacteria dominated the net redox activity in the study. Um, yep. So fast forward 10 years or so, 2014, yeah, 10 years, 2015, um, this pilot study was, greenhouse pilot study, uh, happened with this Sanchez Espinoza, um, and what she did is she wanted to look at this Agrobacterium tumefaciens, this 5A, the arsenite oxidizer, to use it as a way to detoxify arsenic in the root zone, um, but also compare that to these sort of common in situ remediation approaches like the lime and organic matter or compost. Um, so what they did is they went out, uh, grabbed some slickens. They had about 2,000 ppm arsenic, and then they grew out basin wild rye um, in these amendment combinations. So they had a lime only, the eco compost only, uh, the eco compost plus the agrobacterium tumefaciens, the 5A, the one that can oxidize arsenic, arsenite, um, and then they added the lime and the bacteria, and then they also used that mutant. So it's the same organism, they just have the the oxidizer and the reducing form of that um, with the, again, the compost and the compost with slime treatments. And clearly, just qualitatively, when we look at this potting soil, uh, the space and wild rye growing in the potting soil with no arsenic, um, lime seemed to have no benefit by itself, compost a little bit, um, but really that there's a huge difference 
um, qualitatively in the growth when, in the presence of this oxidizing bacteria. And um, maybe a, a better way to look at this is uh, with this graph. Um, this is not my graph, so I apologize there's no error bars or anything like that. Um, this is not my study. Mm. But it does tell a good, a good story. So um, what you have on the Y is essentially a, a ratio because this dotted line is the plant biomass um, of the organic matter plus lime treatment, so the compost plus lime treatment. So they normalize this graph to show that um, what does the plant growth biomass look like, both shoot and root, when you have this arsenite oxidizer plus compost uh, and this arsenate reducer uh, and compost compared to you know what would be a normal application in anaconda the lime plus organic matter. And so you see about two and a half times more growth with this oxidizing bacteria than you do with the OM plus lime and of course this reducing bacteria so maybe making the arsenite more available tox you know instead of detoxifying or uh, making that that root zone the rhizosphere more tolerable of arsenic it might be doing the opposite so taking arsenate to arsenite which we know now is 10 times more toxic so that could be the impact there um, so this does kind of lead into this idea of comprehensive remediation. Um, and so just to go over the amendments again, um, lime, you know, it has some soil benefits. It raises the pH. It has some nutrients. Um, it tends to immobilize the big four metals that we have in this area, copper, zinc, lead, cadmium. However, it's been shown to highly mobilize arsenic, so not great. Uh, and then the cost is $35 a cubic yard, so not super expensive uh, to buy. Um, and then compost, I think, is, is very interesting because not only is it increasing soil benefit by increasing nutrient, water holding capacity, it also immobilizes these metals based on, one, the organic matter complex, but also the raisin pH. And depending on that source or how that compost is made, if it's coming from biosolids, Biosolids has been sh have been shown to really immobilize arsenic. So you could essentially treat with biosolids, you could treat everything. Um, however, most compost, and especially like eco-compost, has a lot of plant-derived, a lot of plant-derived. So you kind of have a, a, it's, you know, it could either do, it could either immobilize some of that, like with the iron, the 64 to 9600 ppm iron, um, or it could mobilize arsenic because of that liming content. So. That's something that we're going to pursue, and it's relatively cheap, so $30 a cubic yard. Um, biochar, I think, is great. We have a lot of, you know, I was a forester, so we have a lot of woody res residue. We burn a lot of these, ta a lot of these piles, and um, I think there's a better way to do that. Also, it promotes thinning, um, but we just don't have the capacity to do biochar, really, in Montana. Uh, but it does, again, increase cation cation exchange capacity, water holding capacity, it has been shown to immobilize uh, metals and it's kind of an intermediate with arsenic. So it can, it, it, it will be the least of these three. Uh, however, this is the downfall of it, it's insanely expensive. $250 a cubic yard. So that, that's not really working right now. Um, but because the solubility and bioavailability of metals and arsenic may be different following amendment application, uh, we should think about ways to address both. And so I think the Sanchez Espinosa pilot study showed that we could potentially use these arsenic, arsenite oxidizing bacteria paired with soil amendments, uh, compost specifically, uh, to provide maybe a more comprehensive approach. Um, but moving going forward, the Sanchez Espinosa study was ultimately limited in some regards because it only looked at basin wild rye. And basin wild rye can really grow wherever it wants, on whatever it wants, so it's not super sensitive um, plant. And they only used one microbe, and they used tailings, fluvial tailings. And as we all know, those are being dug up, so potentially the impact or the next soils that this could go and be worked on are these airborne emission soils and maybe not so much the fluvial tailings. 
Uh, so that's where I was thinking and moved this to this, uh, another greenhouse. So we started another greenhouse, or I did, uh, last June, finished up in September, um, to kind of move forward with adding more plant species, looking at different inocula, um, and then of course I looked at the different organic amendments as opposed to lime. Uh, but we had some <laughs> overarching questions. Uh, for all of it, and are those arsenite oxidizing bacteria present, and can we find them in soils of varying arsenic contamination <coughs> for use as inocula? So, in other words, you know, that uh, where the egg tumefaciens came from in the Madison River, that's a naturally occurring level of arsenic that's been there for a very long time. Now we have 100 years maybe of smelting process or arsenic contamination in anaconda. I guess the question for me was, are they there and can we find them and then can we use them? Um, so the second thing is, what is the germination response of plants to various soil amendments and microbial inocula treatment combinations? How does plant above and below ground biomass respond different uh, to soil amendments and inoculate and treatment combinations? And do plant species vary in their response to different um, soil amendment and inoculate treatments? I won't talk about that much, maybe a little bit, but not too much. Um, and then what is the fate of metals, copper, zinc, lead, and cadmium, and arsenic following soil amendments in these microbial inoculate treatments? And that's the next step for me. Like I said, this just kind of finished uh, up and uh, we're slowly but surely chugging along to try and get this done. Um, so, but I will start with the part one, the part one which was trying to isolate these arsenite oxidizing um, bacteria. And so, to do that you have to start with soil. And so I took soil samples from the top five centimeters at 11 different locations, uh, excuse me, from varying distance uh, from the smelter. So the closest was five or 4.35 kilometers. The furthest away was uh, about nine. All these sites are thought to be impacted from the airborne emissions. Um, and then the 11 sites captured four different soil series. And the total arsenic between them all ranged from 146 to 1,065. That's milligrams per kilogram. Uh, milligrams arsenic per kilogram soil or PPM and so that's a, a pretty huge range. Uh, so the next step is to uh, I guess get them out and count them and see what they're doing um, and so I did that with the dilution <coughs> plant count method. Um, I made an auger uh, with different carbon sources and then I spiked that that auger with a hundred millimolar arsenite so AS3 which Math comes out to be about 75 milligrams per liter, uh, parts per million. Um, so what I did was I took 10, 10, uh, what did I do? 10 grams of soil, and I ended up diluting that out into these different plates. Um, I think I went out to 10 to the minus 6 dilutions. Well, anyway, this is about a 10 to the minus 3 dilution, so you couldn't really count on uh, smaller dilutions. But what I did was I looked at these different colonies for morphological differences. So color, opaqueness, uh, size. They were then picked and then subcultured onto this plate. Uh, this plate then was subsequently flooded with silver nitrate. Silver nitrate reacts with uh, arsenate and it turns that dark brown color. So it's kind of a rapid qualitative way to see what these microbes are doing. Are they oxidizing arsenite? Um, and that's exactly what we did there. And so these, if these turn brown, they got then subcultured again to these, these quartile plates, grew out a little bigger, uh, they were flooded again, and you can see a clear brown. Those two passed the test. Some of these turned a little brown, but they didn't turn that brown, so they, they did not move forward. Um, so again, the question is, are these oxidizing bacteria present and can we find them? The answer is sort of. The, there's eight, I isolated over 800 unique colonies and that's just the visual morphological difference. Um, and I only came up with three prolific arsenite oxidizers, the ones that could really turn brown like that. There was only, I only came up with three. Now some did, yes? Culture on plates? You took from soil and only cultured on plates? Or yeah. did you try and continue culture in soil? No, only plates. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, yep, okay. Um, and then there was some, like I said, that showed some of that brown, but it didn't have the same intensity, so they didn't, they didn't, we didn't really mess with them. Uh, even incorporating those, is still less than 1% of all the isolates turned brown or were, you know, arsenite oxidizing. Um, ox arsenite oxidizing. And the interesting thing is they all came from uh, one soil type, and that's the Posega silty clay. Um, and then I used two in my study, uh, the Pseudom Pseudomonas fluorescence and the Pseudomonas tanensis, along with Agrobacterium tumefaciens, which came from Madison River into the Sanchez study, and then we used it one more time in mine. <clears throat> so I also had to collect soil for my greenhouse uh, study, and that soil was collected south of the Opportunity Ponds. Um, again, it was thought to be contaminated by airborne emissions. Um, I collected soils from the top 20 centimeters. They were then sieved through a two millimeter screen, two millimeter sieve. Uh, this site is projected to re receive a 12 inch till dilution solution treatment in the next year, couple years. Um, and then the physical chemical conditions of that soil. So after it's been sieved, um, it's really going to start mimicking this kind of 12 inch till, maybe even more so. Uh, but I had, and these are totals. I wish I had bioavailable um, numbers, but I don't. So we'll just have to deal with totals. So total arsenic after being sieved, homogenized, uh, was 463 milligrams per kilogram or parts per million. Copper was a total of 815, zinc 680, lead 348, cadmium 13. So still very, very elevated. Um, Again, that's just half the story because I don't have bioavailable numbers. Um, maybe soon. Um, so pH of 6.5, again, that's probably driving. That's really driving this 12-inch till solution, I think, is the near neutral pH. And then we had pretty good soil organic matter. This is done on loss of ignition. So heated organic matter or soil at 450 degrees C for four hours, or six hours, excuse me, and then the difference is essentially the organic matter. And that came out to be about 4.5%, so pretty high for Montana soils. It's actually a pretty good soil uh, for Anaconda area. Um, so, yep, moving forward then, I had into the greenhouse study, the treatments where I had four soil amendments. 10% volume to volume of eco-compost, 10% uh, volume volume black owl biochar. Uh, that's from Washington and it's woody residue derived. And then I did a combination of 5% volume biochar and 5% eco-compost. Uh, and then the control was unamended. <clears throat> and then also four bacterial treatments, the agrobacterium tumefaciens, which has been slowly coming along, and then the two two of my isolates again, the Pseudomonas fluorescence and the Pseudomonas tanensis. And Pseudomonas, uh, all three of these are, have been shown to have some sort of plant growth promoting characteristics, but I think they've all been shown to also maybe be antagonistic to some extent or kind of cause a little ruckus in the root zone. Um, and then the control was just water only. And so I did a full, you know, we had a full factorial design, control, and then the inoculum up top in each of those saw uh, plant only, plant plus OM, plant plus biochar, plant uh, plus both biochar and compost. And in the end, it was 16 treatment combinations, seven reps, four plant species, and that was 448 containers. So a pretty good size greenhouse study. Um, and then the plant species, we had four plant species. Three of those species came from the USDS, USDA, uh, NRCS's Bridger plant materials, that uh, heavy metal tolerant release program. Um, and those were basin wall rye, Nevada bluegrass, slender wheatgrass. And then we had one species I used for a Montana Tech's native plant program, and that was prairie june grass. Um, unfortunately, prairie june grass didn't perform very well, so it, it, I kind of dropped it from all subsequent analysis. Uh, a, a reason for that is it's a very drought-loving plant, and this was a greenhouse, so it was getting no shortage of water, um, among other things that could have caused that. Uh, so, like I said before, this is kind of in its early stages, so I don't want to get too far um, in the weeds with my results. So I say something that I don't know how to back up or what I'm talking about, but I did think there's some interesting trends, so I thought I'd share that, uh, share those with you. 
Um, and then the questions again are, what is the germination response of these plants to the various treatment combinations? How do these plants respond, plants respond to different soil treatment combinations? And do they vary, these plants, do they vary in their response? Um, this is pretty tricky to answer, and I don't know if I at this moment really can, but I can point out some uh, who did what. Uh, so with germination, we used a generalized, general linearized model to come up with a probability or an odds of germination. So on this y-axis, this is actually the probability of germination for each plant species, slender wheatgrass, basin wild rye, Nevada bluegrass, in the presence of the soil amendments. We had a very significant two-way interaction between plant species and soil amendment. And so then your soil amendments down here are no amendment, biochar, biochar plus compost, compost, uh, and then that continues along. And what we see is that uh, slender wheatgrass by far across all, all amendments had the highest probability of germinating. Even with the no amendment, it did pretty well. Uh, where these other two species, basin wild rye and slender wheatgrass, it really needed some help, right? Maybe not here with the biochar. But basin wild rye, we have this steady increase from each amendment up. Um, and then we also see that here with Poa secunda, the Nevada bluegrass, that it really responded well to biochar plus compost and compost, or the, the germination response did. Um, yeah. OK. Uh, so the root biomass, uh, again, um, basin wild rye, it produced the most biomass across all treatments. I don't, not showing this data, I think uh, for time and ease, I think it's easier to maybe show this, the inoculum uh, amendment effect plot. Uh, but bi basin wild rye did produce the most root biomass of all the three species. In fact, it produced four times more root biomass in, with the addition of biochar plus compost and compost, then the no amendment, no inoculate treatment, which mimics that 12 inch dilution solution um, uh, treatment effect. So we have here in our model, we have amendment is highly significant, um, and there's no apparent inoculo effect. And what we see that here. Uh, so we see these that. Oh, I should probably explain this. So amendment zero, so that's just the water only. Uh, oh, sorry, that's soil only, uh, no treatment. Amendment B is biochar, biochar plus compost, and compost. And then down here is the inoculus, so zero. 5A is the agrobacterium tumefaciens. D3 is the pseudomonas tansis, and then the D4 is pseudomonas fluorescence. But just across the, the no amendment inoculum is pretty much the same as the biochar plus inocula, but then we do see a big uptick here with the biochar plus compost and the compost. However, these are kind of, these are not significantly different across inocula. So that's really where we get in this no inocula effect. It's really biochar, biochar plus compost that's driving these differences in root biomass. Um, and here we have the, uh, kind of a interesting here is each inocula responded, um, I guess, maybe negatively, or the plant response was negative in the presence of one inocula and for each uh, different um, soil amendment. So pseudomonas tansis and biochar, not good. Uh, Agrobacterium tumefaciens and biochar plus compost, not good. Uh, and then we have the pseudomonas fluorescence and compost is not good. A lot of things falling off there, so possibly we have some of that pathogenic effect there in the roots. Um, and the shoot biomass generally follows um, a similar trend as the, the, as the roots. Um, However, the, the producers of biomass, the, the larger producer of biomass when it comes to shoots rather than roots, that plant changed. Uh, in general, slender wheatgrass produced the most shoot biomass across all treatments. Um, however, both Nevada bluegrass and slender wheatgrass produced four, at least four times more shoot biomass in the presence of the D3, the pseudomonas, or pseudomonas tansis, and compost treatment 
uh, compared to that no soil amendment, no inoculate treatment. Again, that's the kind of mimicking that 12 inch dilution solution treatment. Um, and like I said, it's a similar, similar story. We do have this highly uh, significant amendment effect and little uh, and probably no inocula effect. And that's evident by, again, across inocula treatments, there's really no difference in biomass between each inocula. But we do see a general trend from um, as we're moving across amendments up. So again, biochar plus compost. Compost is really driving that beneficial plant growth. Um, and just like the roots, those shoots follow the same pattern. So when the roots weren't doing great, the shoots weren't doing great. And we see that right here again with biochar, Pseudomonas tansis, uh, biochar plus compost in agrobacterium tumefaciens, and then that compost in Pseudomonas fluorescence. Um, so again, maybe pathogenic, antagonistic, I don't know. But we do see a clear pattern here, and that is that soil amendments are really driving this beneficial plant response. Um, so why is there such a big contrast? I mean, that Sanchez Espinosa saw a crazy response, two and a half times more growth in the presence of this inocula in organic matter or compost, and then we don't see it. We see that soil amendment's really driving um, that beneficial plant growth. And so there's a couple things. I mean, there, the, there's probably many, 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 many reasons. But just a couple reasons here is there is five times higher arsenic in the Sanchez Espinosa study. They did a DI warm water extraction um, to get at extractable arsenic. And that's what I kind of recreated one of their graphs. But uh, <clears throat> that's what we have here. We have water extractable arsenic on the Y. That's milligrams per kilogram. Um, and then on the, the X here are the different treatments. So tailings only, lime and organic matter, uh, OM, lime, the reducing organic matter, <coughs> or sorry, reducing bacteria. Um, and then what is that? OM, lime, and the oxidizer, um, OM, just OM in the reducing bacteria, and OM and the oxidizing bacteria. So they say this is a mistake. <laughs> um, so like I said, this is not my study. I don't have the data. Uh, but this, they don't say is a mistake. And that alone, that extractable amount of arsenic, um, water extractable amount of arsenic in the lime plus oxidizing plus compost, that's more than my total arsenic in my study, which is kind of crazy. So. <clears throat> We do see that there's different soil, you know, there's two different soils here. We have the fluvial tailings versus something contaminated or polluted by the airborne emissions. So again, the source of arsenic is probably different and also the likely the form. So the form is different. Is it what's in, is it more arsenite or is it more arsenate? You know, these are some of these questions that we want to move forward. Um, I did want to talk, I guess, a little more about this because I think it's pretty interesting. Um, I, I try to arrange these so you're always comparing the two treatments that had lime. Um, and what we see is like every time there's lime added, we see uh, a huge spike. And so that kind of follows the idea that liming and raising that pH without treating that tox arsenic toxicity is really mobilizing arsenic, which then can be potentially bioavailable in impact plant performance. Um, so another thing why she might have saw great response is I did everything on a volume to volume basis. She did weight. She did 5% weight and that comes out to be about twice as much compost is what I added to mine. Um, also I had a 4.5% four, soil organic matter already. Organic matter uh, in the soil depending on the, the type and the amount can really bind metals in arsenic, probably maybe preventing it from being you know, available for plant uptake or you know being uh, toxic to plants and then again she used lime and I used biochar there's some things there that maybe need to be worked out um, moving forward and then ultimately I mean these questions are still here how do they impact arsenic mobility and how is that then impacting plant health um, good questions so 
To summarize, uh, here are the effects of metals and arsenic on soil properties, either biological, chemical, or physical, are controlled by complex rela uh, re reactions, and, this, and their bioavailability depends on this dynamic equilibria between solid and liquid phases of the soil. And uh, going further here, solubility of metalloids, so thereby uh, potentially being phyto or bioavailability, uh, is often a function of pH. Um, and is affected by the amount of kind, like I've been saying, affected by the amount and kind of organic matter. So pH and organic matter, but also cation exchange capacity of soil. More cation exchange capacity of, in the soil, potentially there's more ability for that soil to hold or bind these metals. Um, clay minerals, kind of a similar story. And uh, there's a few more, but I'm not gonna get into that. But the take home, I think, for me here is that all these factors can affect the metals and arsenic, the solubility and mobility differently. Uh, and I do, I think we see this in the results between the two greenhouse studies, uh, but overall both, I think both experiments show the importance of soil amendments, uh, including the use of microbial inocula when we start comparing that to maybe the current practices, like in the sanchez Espinosa study, they are comparing it to the lime plus OM, and my study is a tilling only comparison. Um, so while well, the amendment effect for biochar plus compost and compost in my study kind of dissolves uh, the inoculum effect, we do see fourfold increases in shoot biomass for Nevada bluegrass and uh, basin wild rye, or sorry, slender wheatgrass, uh, when growing with this compost plus Pseudomonas tensis um, treatment compared to the no amendment, no, no treatment. And uh, these interesting, I think these interesting plant responses uh, trends require further geochemical analysis, physical chemical analysis, kind of maybe tease apart potential controls on arsenic and metal mobility. Um, so we have funding for a third greenhouse study and it's gonna start later this spring. I think getting into <laughs> My study in this sort of data, data analysis, there is way more questions now than when we started and when we pitched this uh, last proposal that got funded. Um, but we do have some directions that we're leaning towards and maybe we're gonna start looking more at depth of the form and species of these metalloids because arsenic species, is, it matters, but so does copper. And I didn't really address that, but copper species really drives toxicity as well. Um, and how those are impacting, what impact that has in the rhizosphere. And so we'd also like to start looking at how these plants are taking up and translocating these metals and metalloids. And also another one is these plant microbe interactions. Are these plant growth promoting microbes? Are they doing some sort of antagonistic or negative, having some sort of impact that way? Um, but I bring this map up again just because I think it just shows there's a lot of, um, we don't know a lot about what's going on out there right now. <clears throat> and I think there's a lot of opportunity to start developing maybe more cost effective or um, comprehensive remediation approaches because how long is it before Lyme's immobilizing effect becomes an immobilizing effect, right? These treatments are not forever. So uh, I just think there's a lot of opportunity here to really study this stuff and maybe make some informed decisions moving forward. Uh, so with that, I'd like to thank um, Tim McDermott at MSU and Dr. Robert Powell and Ben Coleman. They will be co-advising me moving forward. I'm leaving MSU and coming to Tech and uh, U of M. And then the MSU statistical consulting class, they helped me with that generalized linear model. Uh, Bridger Plant Material Center provided seeds and EcoCompost gave me compost for free. Biochar, Black Owl Biochar gave me compost for free as well. Um, so with that, I guess I'll take questions. Mm -hmm. yeah, so I'm, a, I'm a microbiologist, so I have a question. Um, so just because you inoculate with those species, I mean, that doesn't mean that's what you have three days later. So did you, did you do any analysis of your soil at the end to see we'll see if your microbe was still uh, there in any numbers? Not yet. I think that's going to be <clears throat> on the up and coming. We're still trying to figure out the best way to do that. Maybe Q QPCR. 
Uh, Agrobacterium tumefaciens has a high um, tolerance to antibiotics, so there might be something we can go there. And then the Pseudomonas fluorescence turns blue in the presence of arsenic, so I guess we've just been trying to figure out maybe the best way and how you do measure longevity of this inocula. It's a great point, what you brought yeah, up. If these, if these are things that you're easy, you know, you, know you, could, you could have tried to play them out on all kinds of stuff, but if they played out easily enough on nutrient auger, you could simply do a dilution and, and they may be readily identifiable even by their cultural <coughs> characteristics. You might be able to mm -hmm. identify them that way. And I guess I'd say you probably obviously have some uh, nitrogen fixing bacteria in there because you're getting great growth. Um, I don't know if you did a nitrogen phosphorus potassium analysis of the soil uh, before you started or not. No. You no. Uh, yeah. That's all. The soil is all frozen. So that's a. There's just a lot of stuff going on. Um, the an environmental analytical lab at MSU won't do, they won't run a latchet on metal contaminated soil. So we didn't have much money. <laughs> okay. So it's like, they're not going to do it. I don't know. We couldn't send it I, anywhere. I so the George Environmental Lab, they do a $10 a sample for 12 metals. Oh, there we are. I'm going to write that, I'm going to write that down. Because <laughs> Energy Labs is a little more expensive than that. <laughs> Yes, hi. Um, have you done any sequencing on these strains of bacteria? Uh, just to identify them. Just to identify them? Mm -hmm. so, so have you looked at what they're doing with the arsenic? What transfer protein they use? Oh, uh, the egg tumefaciens has been studied in depth about that. The Pseudomonas fluorescence and the Pseudomonas tansis, that I haven't touched any of the genetic stuff with that, but Tim McDermott, that agrobacterium, that's his baby. That thing has been studied and studied and studied. He could tell you all about enzyme and, and gene. Is it one that can insert its genome into the plant, or is it? See, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> OK, any else? No? What the, oh. What's the source of the compost? Uh, eco compost in Missoula, uh, it's like and it's just got bought out by the city, I think. So it gets biosolid waste, but it also people are bringing their plant waste there, and it's all mixed up and bagged. Um, it's kind of a hodgepodge <laughs> of stuff. When the arsenic is mobilized, uh, how much shows up in the plant? How much? Do you, do you have an increase? Uh, <clears throat> so this was, this was shoot arsenic uh, okay. in plants. And so I don't, you know, this was just based on wild rye. Uh, and this result doesn't make a lot of sense, but because it's saying that the arsenite oxidizing bacteria uh, is causing more uptake of arsenic, which we're saying that it shouldn't be more mobile, but I think it's just that really it's a difference in the amount of biomass that was in these pots. Um, so I don't know how that corresponds to other grasses, but ag tumefaciens has been used in China, um, and they've used like popular plantations in ag tumefaciens as an inoculum to get heavy metals and arsenic out, and in the presence of agrobacterium tumefaciens, it takes up a lot of the, that will study show that it t that those trees took up a lot of arsenic. Um, so the potential there for a phyto extraction um, could be there. I mean, potentially the egg tumefaciens does promote a lot of uptake of arsenic into that plant. I can't speak to the other two because we haven't got that far. I haven't done the digestions on the other biomass. Yeah. So what do you think of the arsenic that is infused and it's covered in topsoil, it's lined and everything? You said that there is uncertainties, you know, it's not that the treatments are not forever, it can be mobilized, not mobilized. So what do you think of the topsoil and the ideas? So it's kind of just a theoretical question. What how do you see that in the long term? Because 
in, in Anaconda and many of those places, they're not even topsoil, they just have different, um, they're, they're in the process of, of having, having it fixed, but mm -hmm. if, it's, if it's the fix that we have in view here, is there anything that would concern us? Like in the immediate, uh, taking new topsoil and putting that down. Yeah. So, what what do you think with plants? We having that cap. We having the plants in there. Will there be in the long term changing much, or what can we expect? Uh, do do you know? You see what I mean? You mean how long? The sustainability of the tree. Yeah. Right. Uh, well, I don't think any of these in-situ treatments really have a super long-term um, outlook. I would think that lime is probably your longest lasting. Um, I think that compost might get through quicker. Uh, however, the eco-compost does have all sorts of different carbon sources, so different types of plants in there that would promote some sort of long-term um, presence in the soil. I don't really know. I don't think there's been a lot of work done on what the longevity of these immobilizing effects of Lyme are. I mean, so I can't really speak to that. Yeah, but it would be well worth you to set up yeah. experiments and see that how long that fix is going to help us. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, my name is Jay Cornish. Hi, Jay. I, it, uh, I don't know. Have you seen this document here, this technical note? Uh, the reason I'm only saying this is just going to credibility here. Uh, I've worked on phytoremediation, both excluding and pumping of various metals, metalloids, uh, transuranics, okay. uh, fission products, and so forth for EPA and DOE for. Oh. For about a decade. Yeah, I know that paper. <laughs> well, have you read? Well, it? I, I, have yeah. you at least seen it? Yeah, I've seen so it. I'm just, I began, I just simply started that as an entree, but I do have some background in yeah. biogeochemistry of all of this. And I'm very intrigued with uh, what you're doing. I, I okay. was a little disappointed I, I, when I saw that you had made a proposal, or at least I think maybe Dr. Hartshorn and all had I, made a that proposal. Was... And, I, and, I, and I asked uh, Dr. Pals as to why it wasn't funded. Uh -huh. Not because, and, and I wasn't saying that in an adversarial way, but just because I was curious. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, frankly, I saw there's a lot of technical detail, like statistical stuff that I, I saw missing, but then again, you were just trying to get the point across that, yeah, this is a good idea to try. Yeah. Um, well, we only have, they, at that time, the only study was that Sanchez Espinosa study for looking at specific. Um, yeah, what I'm referring oh. to is, is uh, this, this proposal. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and uh, there is that, that, as you were saying here, uh, you know, this, the Sanchez uh, work. Mm -hmm. And I was just trying to understand how you guys, you in particular, were progressing beyond that. Yeah. And so in the course of that, I, I saw, I found all sorts of questions. And I know, for instance, that one of the classic ones is uh, that I used to argue with EPA and DOE folks all the time. I was trying to find my the, the graph here that <coughs> they always used to say that if you can imagine this pie here being the total contaminant mass, let's say total arsenic. Mm -hmm. And by total arsenic, I mean acid extractable. Right. I mean, there's something in the, bound up in a silicate, you know, like mm -hmm. you, have, you know, stuff that's more or less p least potentially bioavailable, which is defined as that little B pie. Mm -hmm. And that if you're trying to, to improve the, the, the mass transfer, let's say biologically, so now the pie is this big, that this different, this the, the residual, so to speak, is is now this pie here, and it, and it begs the question, also shown in this way, that over time, and this is the sustainability uh, thing where 
where if you start with some initial concentration in rooting zone soils and you proceed in time, mm -hmm. do you really think that you can get enough mass transfer from the soil? Let's say a, a cubic foot of soil weighs 100 pounds. Okay. Uh, and you only get maybe a few hundred grams of dry biomass per season. Mm -hmm. And if you start doing this sort of thing, then you find that it, you could take many decades to remove the biologically available fraction, which may or may not, again, comply with some risk-based standard, which is always total. Again, I don't right. want to sound like I'm being critical, because I'm just frustrated as the Dickens about yeah, this. Yeah, I don't, I don't have any, I have no interest in phytoextraction. My goal is yeah, phyto exclusion. Is phyto exclusion. Right, which is what uh, so, Ma Nature kind of does with lead. Yeah. You know, it, it tends to trap the, 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 the lead in, in, the, in the root biomass mm -hmm. rather than bringing it up bring into it up. the shoots and so forth. Yeah. Yeah, so I agree with this. Uh, the original that Sanchez Espinosa was pitched as a, as a phyto extraction, but I'm a realist, okay. so excellent. Uh, I have to shake you your hand again, <laughs> because yeah. because after ten years of, of fighting with this and, uh -huh. and having, you know, drawing these sorts of curves, uh -huh. where the people say, okay, I can have, again and again, this was important in DOE, like say, like where you have superficial contamination with transuranics or fission products, okay. where uh, you it's 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 a, a, a serious problem you know, because of the radiation and so forth. And you, you, when people say, well, okay, if we're gonna fool around with this for let's say 20 or 30 years, taking up micro quantities, you know, by mass, each growing season versus getting our, our guy in, in, a, in a level B suit mm -hmm. on a, a D9 cat, and, and a lot of, and actually sometimes at the end of these things where they would scrape up, they would simply, abandon or bury the, the equipment. Oh. It was so crapped up. So what I'm saying is, but they get the thing done fast. Yeah, right. And so you have the regulators saying, get it done. Mm -hmm. As opposed to kind of, it's like I used to joke about hammers. The D9 cat was the 10 pound hammer. Yeah. And the phytoremediation, particularly the phyto extraction approach, was like the little <laughs> jewelers. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. go ding, 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 right. ding. And, and you, you found that you just didn't have the patience for that. In mm. fact, it worked like, oh, like over in Stucky Ridge, you know, that, that's referenced, you know, in this, this, this paper here. Yeah. Uh, yes, it shows that, that um, the plants can stabilize the biologically available fraction of the big five, and they can keep concentrations of the big five to levels that are more or less tolerable to wildlife livestock. Mm -hmm. But it's still the matter of people saying, well, lime, we'll just add lime. Yeah. With or without organic matter, whether it's, you know, organic of whatever sort. Uh -huh. So there's this, I'm frustrated, you can tell I'm frustrated by trying to sell this. Yeah. <laughs> because it all boils down to risk and, and mitigation, if not elimination of risk. And so people say, well, gee whiz, you've gone, uh, let's say, e even, if, if you folk, even if you concentrate a certain fraction of the total mass in the roots, it's still there. And the proverbial dirt-eating kid can still eat that stuff. Right. And so, as a matter of pure science, this is lovely. I think that if I was probably 25 or 30 years younger, I'd probably be working on my doctorate on, on the same sort of stuff you're doing now. So I think it's great work. I'm just seriously concerned about the selling of it. Yeah. And I hate to be so crass. <laughs> yeah, it's a photo. It's a phyto stabilization, really, is what it is. It's supposed to. Yeah. You know. Uh, Have you heard of a guy named Rufus Cheney? No. Oh, well, he's a guy from the USDA. 
He's a soil scientist uh, that has probably about three or four hundred papers on phytoremediation, okay. largely phyto extraction. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know that there's a huge amount of academic work going on, but I'm frustrated by not seeing it widely applied. And I think, again, it's a, it's a function of time and mass transfer. And so, I, I'm not discouraging this work, because again, I'd love to do this work if I could. Uh, but I'm just kind of wondering if you're going to be challenged in terms of its utility down the road. Yeah, I can see that DNRC or NRDP or whoever having some. Well, I'm talking about curious. EPA. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or the and EPA. Because, again, they they did a lot of funding of this sort of work, and they've kind of backed off on it now. Right. Uh, DOE as well, Department of Energy. Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to prevent that from going this route. I yeah. think there's a a lot of stuff going on out there that we there haven't is. even looked and at. There are journals um, called phytoremediation, so, for instance. Yeah, and so I guess. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to keep. But uh, but I but at it. again, with all that negative negativity aside, <laughs> I would very much like to have a copy of your slides if I could. Okay. Would would that be possible? Mm -hmm. Because uh, if if I could help you at all on this. I would, I would love to do that. Okay. I'd like to keep my fingers in this pie. All right. I mean, again, goes to, it goes back to what Mittman was saying about the sustain, uh, about uh, the, the competitiveness, about uh, over time, if you if you inoculate a soil, like the, a lot of groundwater studies, they would inoculate, like for TC, TCE mm -hmm. they would inoculate with with a chlorine uh, particular thing that could chew up chlorine, but it wasn't competitive with the natural flora. Mm -hmm. And so I, uh, on this case here, I keep wondering whether or not with these arsenic oxidizers, you're also it, you're encouraging iron oxidizers. Because the iron oxidizers are going to turn, uh, I mean, they're going to they're turn the iron into o iron oxide hydroxides, which in turn are going to bind the arsenic. Yeah. Yeah, the compost and, is, we're just starting to look at this compost. And, 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 yeah, so, um, and, and pseudomonas is a denitrifier, so that explains why that didn't work. <laughs> it, it takes nitrate to atmospheric right. nitrogen. Right. So. And, 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 and you get in the classic slide there, you, the, the thing is, is that if you add lots of lime, the, it's, the, it's the old amphoteric nature of arsenic and a lot of the metals. You know that you have a, a curve like this, and solubility goes like this. And I mean, again, if this, this is soluble arsenic, you have relatively high, let's say, a four and a ten. Mm -hmm. And so what you're doing is, is that, particularly if you have a, 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 a chemical, condi a biochemical condition where you have arsenic being reduced, first being solubilized at high pH, and then reduced to three. You're, 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 you said on your slide that th arsenic-3 is 10 times, tenfold more toxic. And mobile, So yeah. essentially, you're taking all that arsenic, you're not only liberating it, but you're turning it into a biologically toxic form. So that's why it's not surprising that yeah. you're seeing a, a gross reduction in, 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 in biomass production. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I'm off my toes. <laughs> uh, but if, if I, can I, I don't have a business card anymore. Uh, uh, you don't? <laughs> Either do I. I, I, can, I can give you, I, can, I think I have an old MSC one, but you don't want that. might not go through. Oh, I thought you still worked over at MSC. No, no, I've moved on to better things. Oh, you have? Okay. Yes, absolutely. So. <laughs> you know, this. Sign me up for that. <laughs> yeah, I remember. I remember the algae days, uh, the, the, the corral. Oh yeah, well, I remember that well. Some, I was. I was going to tell him I'm doing some studies now, actually, with bacterial and algal amendments to soil, and I'm using moss and I'm using nitrogen. I'm using bacteria that fix nitrogen at pH is below four, and stuff like that. And we're getting great, great results. So. Uh, if, if I can help you in any way, uh, Robert has my email. He can give yeah. it to you. Yeah. I'd be happy to help you. Because I, I, I'm not a molecular biologist, but I know a lot about microbes and bugs what they do. Bugs, <laughs> or don't do. Bugs, 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 okay? 
it's a constant battle in the soil. I mean, that's right. And, that's and, right. And, it, and it's actually relatively easy to figure out what's there without um, molecular analysis. And uh, if, you, if you go to the Georgia's environmental lab website, I've been using them for 20 years. I'll do samples, 12 metals in soil, 10 bucks. Not 10 bucks a metal, 10 bucks total. Yeah, that's awesome. And, uh, they'll do NPK awesome. for you for, for, for literally peanuts. I mean, I don't know why they even do it so cheap, but it's all QAQC besides. Mm. I mean, even MSC accepted it. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, but you know, there's some really cool stuff. with this what they call metabolic heat maps. You know, I no. was doing some of that work at Oak Ridge, where where they actually will, will show you the, the they won't tell you necessarily the the plant or the flora that's doing it, but they'll tell you which genes or enzymes are at it. But you can see wonderful shifts in terms of like nit nitrogen oxidizing versus reducing processes. It's really cool. They have chips you can put in the soil. We'll yeah, tell you kind of everything, yeah, but that's well, it's really yeah, expensive. It's really expensive. Yeah. The stuff was done, yeah, it was developed out by PNNL out yeah. in, in Hanford. Yeah, it's really expensive. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. besides that, great talk. Yeah. So, What's your name? Grant Mittman. Nice to meet you, Grant. So he's an algae guy. Yeah. I'm an algae guy. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, it's it's Jay Cornish at Pioneer-Technical.com. Okay. And, and again, even though I sound very negative, it's just because I've been keeping this all cooped up for a long time. Yeah, <laughs> and bioremediation, this thing is kind of an entry into what I'm really... Which is? Plant soil feedback, specifically um, more so than a bioremediation aspect. Just, oh, yeah. Well, that's, that was, that was my, that's my background, plant and soils, biogeochemistry. Yeah. Uh, but I've been working on water stuff that's lately because that's what pays the bills. Yeah, I know. There's so many water people. <laughs> Trust me, I was a soil scientist you're professionally. Still with Pioneer, right? so you, What's that? You're, you're still with Pioneer, right? You, you're with the company. With what? Pioneer. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how I. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so if I, if I gave the impression that it was a phyto extraction pitch, that's not the case. Was that from me saying, oh, how is the plant taking up and allocating these metals and metalloids? Did that give you the idea that I was um, pitching phyto extraction? It my head because in England and parts of, of Europe, uh, phyto hyperaccumulators uh, is a cottage industry over there and, and from the academic perspective and and so you see Boku studies where people have these little tiny plants that are about the size of a quarter that are growing growing on Roman aged lead dumps in England yeah. or in yeah. Britain and 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 they say gee whiz these things have a zillion tons, a zillion parts per million of, of, let's say, lead or copper or zinc, whatever. Let's just plant acres and acres of these things, and we will truly have solar-powered biological pumps that will do all sorts of cool things. Well, they don't. Re but if you look at it a little bit more closely, the reason that they're so small in their, in their uh, aerial extent, is it takes a huge amount of metabolic energy for them to, to, for them to, to, to live. And in fact, <laughs> a lot of these little guys, if you take them off the waste rock dumps and plant them just they at the edge of the dump, grow big and no, let them die. Oh, okay. they, they die because they can't compete with, uh, with the, with, ones with the, the native yeah. thing. And, and so that's the analogy yep. with, with the microbes here, mm -hmm. is that you have a fancy bug that does all sorts of wondrous things, but it gets into a bad with gets into bad company, a bad crowd, and it just gets out competed for nutrients, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden, it, it's its effect is essentially is gone. And again, this is not a criticism. This is just an observation of over time, not just me, but many many others. Yeah. No, bioremediation so, yes. is with yeah. microbial nagula is not and does not have a great track record. <laughs> I mean, with organic <laughs> Well, because they can be modified. Some well, even say destroyed, but I don't like that word. But, yeah, I mean, but we're coming in. The organic ones. Idea, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, I mean, like you can yeah. take a, a, an organic a solvent and yeah. leave a chlorine off of it. But, but you can't take. 
arsenic. Exactly. And just destroy it. We always joke about methylating things. You know, like mercury. Getting rid of mercury by methylating it. Well, good luck. Well, it's easy to do, but it's a terrible thing to control. Yeah. Yeah, I actually uh, have those um, studies on the video radiation of those lead, lead contaminated areas. They're kind of a wetland, lands, yeah, like some kind of sedges or something that I. I yeah, guess. sedges, there, there are a lot of sedge species. Yeah, that they worked with or mm -hmm. put into the past. But yeah, you're right. They're really taking over the whole side, and they're just yeah. going and doing their job. From it. Yeah, I'm, I'm really interested more so in the natural things. So, so am I. So am I. I struggled with that for years. So that's my next. That's my next. What are you going to? You got double water extraction. You think about doing sequential extractions? You know, like, so I'm, like, like starting with water and, and going with an oxalate. You know, to start yeah. peeling off yeah. the, the, you know, the different forms. I've thought about it. I've thought about it. What I okay. done, what I what I did for my start with this living yeah. body knowledge for my photo characteristics yeah. stuff. What I was talking about is that he's pouring more salt. I came down the road and I was like, you have done your four parts. Well, mm -hmm. extraction. Yeah. But what they saw is like the one shot extraction correlates very well. To what's extracting what's in plants and then baskets okay. that's kind of the, the standard but I've also ran into this idea of using kind of these organic acids because that mimics, no, because it mimics root exudates yes right absolutely and so I think I'm going to switch so from you know, doing small molecular weight organic acids yes that, in fact that's how the, that's how, how the plants do their business they, they excrete those little exudates that are largely just low molecular weight uh, chelating agents, and they pull the stuff back in, right? So that's kind of where the ammonium salt, it's still good for, uh, you know, whatever, salt, neutral salt. But again, sequential extraction is also another part of it. I mean, there's probably be about at least two dozen different operational systems for that. It's just the cost is so limiting. You know, I, this Monty Gulch work that I had, I sent 36 soil samples to Energy Labs, and they did the ammonium sulfate for me. It was like four grand, forty five hundred dollars for 36. That just doesn't. I know. You know, it's not going to. It's, it's hard to justify. Right? So now you start doing sequential extractions. You're like instead of one, you have to do four. I mean, that's well, like, actually, for arsenic, it probably doesn't really matter. I mean, as opposed to something like maybe, let's say, I don't know, like, copper and iron, some of the transitions that will free you over to. They do a new partition to many, many different forms. Mm -hmm. So, well, again, good luck. So the, <laughs> and and uh, I would like to. to uh, very much like to see your slides. Okay. And if you have some, I don't, I don't, I'm not on Facebook or anything, so I don't have any of that stuff. But, but if you have, you know, like some, some way kind of follow you, like you know, like research great gate. You know, I don't know if you're, yeah. 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 Papers. You, the, you, yeah. Right. I mean, we put out papers. Sign old, papers. Yeah. yeah actually, you're on that. What? You're on that. Oh yeah. Yeah. Good. Oh yeah. <laughs> That's good. That's. That's what. Well, well, I'm on it because it's actually I get updates on all my old stuff. Too, and, yeah, and that's the, that's what people like my many of us are interested in more. Although I'm on Facebook too, but it's because I'm living far from my also my family, and that's easy to contact and see every day. But it's really something that people now they just think that's the first level of communication. Well, in the science or really research, it became really big. Oh yeah. yeah, just in the last couple of or years, or reprints or follow. Yeah, yeah you can get everything if you actually get into contact with the authors. I mean, if yeah. it's their interest, also, well, your paper is two hundred bucks. If I would download it, would you send it to me? Of course, because you would probably cite it. Well, that's what you always do. Is you always look for it. You know, can you download it or not? Yeah, yeah. And then the next step, yeah. Well, I better get contact. <laughs> if you can, then you, then you ask them for a refund. Yeah, yeah. You're right. <laughs> This is I better not use it. Well, you I think you, you have another question. Sorry. Right. Right. Oh, I, 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 I really always like to listen to Jay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Josh will play a technical. Just We're just here listening to the other line. We're just talk about future potential studies. Cool. Yeah. So, what's 
So you actually did your search, your research on. Well, yeah, they did it. My boss over there wanted me to come to this. And I said, in a way, I was kind of wish you hadn't told me about it because I spent most of the good part of the morning, you know, read, reading. Uh, you know, the, the, the yeah. paper here. So that was the one that they submitted? Uh, yeah, the this, yeah. yeah, reading this one and then, and then this thing. So and then, BNRC small, small project, yeah. Right. right. And, then, and, and the reason why it wasn't on, so I, I thought, because I was there, mm -hmm. I think that what they said that it was not relevant to Butte Area 1, you know, for, for, for where they were seeking for. In other words, so if, if, if this was Anaconda, it'd be great. But if it's along the Silver Ball, it's not. That's kind of what it boils down to. But, but you know, the, the, the same thing is just the same. I mean, the, 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 the arsenic is arsenic, right? The, the, it wasn't tactic enough, I think, tactical enough for him. He could have said, well, I have we have samples from you and from Anaconda, and then he would have probably all good. Because, and it's even better because you have kind of a control at another point. So if, if you submitted the assignment paper, sometimes it's just, well, you're, you are too localized. You should have had here, right. there, and make a bigger. Well, that's the thing. I mean, you talk about doing one plot, you will say, well, uh, maybe you should do a bunch of different plots. Yeah. And then they say, well, maybe you should do it over time. Yeah. So you have, you have you know, the X and Y there. And then you begin seeing if there's truly trends in terms of actual performance and sustainability. True. But unfortunately, you don't, they never give you enough money to do that. That's true. And even, even his <laughs> grant would, would have been. And this, this I don't number. Does he say how much? Oh, yeah, ask? yeah. They, they were asking for a like big amount of money. Well, they, 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 again, uh, the, you know, the greenhouse study yeah, yeah, came yeah, about, yeah, about 36, 37. And then when they start getting into the, you know, the field work, it starts getting into. You know, gets into the some money. The yeah, but the, the, that's the uh, NRD. They asked basically about six thousand. Right. Yeah. Uh, wow. Well, well, but and that is, close to a hundred well, for, yeah, from NRD exactly. for the two phases. Well, it was a little steep, I know, because they they run a pretty small project. That's actually, I think, a hundred dollars is the maximum. Yes. yes. Well, that's, that's right. right. No, that wasn't well done either. That, that, that yep, yes, yep. like the, it's the old ninety-nine dollars and ninety-nine cents. Yep. It sounds yep. better than than, just, than a hundred, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. That's all part. I know. I hate to sound so crass, but that's part of the 